This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All, where my guest this week is gardener Benny Hawksby. Benny has a background in biology and gardens with one eye on biodiversity. His projects include the Eden Nature Garden, a community garden designed to be a haven for people and wildlife, and John Little's garden in Essex. We talk about how Benny brings biology and ecology into his work, what we can all do to garden for wildlife whilst reducing our input in terms of resources, and how we can involve the community in building and using gardens that work for everyone. I've absolutely zero horticultural training whatsoever. Um, I grew up in South Wales by the beach, and uh, my mum and I thought it would be a good thing to be to harness my uh, my interest in wildlife to study marine biology. So I actually started off studying in Swansea, and then I ended up working with sea turtles for five or six years, and uh, that was my, the Mediterranean and, and Latin America. So I had got an interesting start after university, and I felt like I didn't really have much of a connection to plants at that point. But I kind of come to realise that actually growing up with my Maltese granddad, he was always growing and, and I hadn't really consciously been aware of it, but I'd subconsciously taken in that kind of part of his life. And uh, yeah, so I, when I kind of finished project work, I ended up moving to London to earn some money and started growing weeds in my back garden because I was kind of fascinated by that. And I ended up growing plants for bees, which was a, a bit of a an in, in, an in for me, really. And um and I found a local little space called Eden Nature Garden in Clapham. And uh, I, th- I thought, I've got to get involved with this. This is kind of therapy and this is something quite special. And I uh, ended up trying to jump into gardening from a, quite a, what seemed like a distant world of marine biology. But yeah, it was kind of, years later, I've realised that they're quite connected. But professionally, I was a marine biologist. So that was my starting point. What is it that you actually do now? Is it purely horticulture? So I'm I'm a gardener through and through now. I'm quite proud and feel quite lucky to be a gardener. I do um, quite a lot of garden maintenance around London in uh, private gardens. And I'm really lucky to work in a public space a day a week in Clapham, the Eden Nature Garden. And I'm also very lucky to help John Little and Fiona Crummy in South Essex on their wonderful garden which uh, your listeners may well be aware of um, from previous episode. And so, yeah, I'm a a gardener through and through now. I'm kind of, yeah, that's kind of my my kind of my proud title, I suppose. Gardener, I like to refer to myself as. And is there an element of planting design to your work as well? Yeah, I I suppose there is, but I'm kind of, I'm like nudging gardens along. So in in some instances, it's been designed by an actual formal designer or a, a designer with a title, but I'm then the custodian afterwards. So I'm kind of nudging the garden along. I'm kind of the future of it, I suppose, in many ways. And then that does involve editing and curating and uh, some nice kind of artistic, you know, autonomy as well. So that's quite nice, but I'm, I don't call myself a designer really, but um, I kind of, I just like the title of gardener so much. I think I just love to be in the soil and I don't spend any time behind computers really apart from tonight, clearly. Well, you are very lucky because computers are are just hideous, in my opinion. But that's interesting because I've always thought that gardening has a little bit of an image problem. And I think gardener and gardening has these connotations of perhaps hobbyists. And I think people have struggled to be taken seriously within the profession, especially when compared with other professions. So it's interesting that you're kind of reclaiming that title. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because when you're in school and people will talk about what career you want to go into or what things you want to be aspire to be, you, you, you seldom hear anyone mentioning plants or gardening, or where I grew up anyway. And so I guess, you know, I studied a science degree, went into the scientific world, and then I've come back around and been like, actually, I've identified a career and a lifestyle that I'm absolutely blown away by. And I think this this, this, this is something that everybody should be doing. And you can... You can earn a living from it. It's not lucrative, but it, you know you can you can get by. But the reward of gardening is is so much greater than the financial side of it. So yeah, you're right. I think it's not deemed necessarily a a career for many people. But I I think that's changing. I think many of us now are kind of 
extolling the virtues of gardening not just for you know the mental health side of things or the physical health I think actually as a career a brilliant career you mentioned obviously bees and you come from that marine biology background I think a lot of your work does incorporate biology and ecology have you found that quite easy to integrate into what you do day to day yeah I mean I, I do find it quite easy to be fair I think perhaps in the early years when I was still learning the trade like I think I maybe I was getting a bit distracted at times, you know, but I think that's quite a nice thing and you've just got to find that balance. But it's, it comes very naturally, you know, that those links with the, the natural world and, and nurturing plants and the earth. Yeah, I think I think it all fits in so, so perfectly then it then actually that, that's meant to be really. I think that should be part of it. And almost every person in the industry, I, I feel, has some kind of connection or affinity towards, you know, the wild species that the that are around us in gardens. So yeah, I think it, it, it sat really well and it, it just kind of it grows and grows for me personally, but into a more kind of a extreme passion. I'm kind of quite into, you know, wild insects now, but I think even as any gardener, really, that's the key kind of component. And I guess there's an element within that of ripping up the rule book a little bit in terms of traditional horticulture. Did you find that you learned within those parameters, but then as you went and grew your own practice, moved away from those because of the biology and the ecology interests? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because obviously I didn't have that formal RHS or paper manner qualification, which I know many people do and many people get a lot from it. But because I didn't have that, I was actually taken under the wing of a, a really nice gardener in, in Clapham who, who started off the Eden Nature Garden, Stephen Barney, and he took me under his wing and unfortunately he had a bit of a, a wildlife kind of arm to his work and he was very ecologically minded but I don't know he's kind of gardening with instinct without any preconceptions and being told to do things a certain way you know I like to leave plant stems you know standing and I don't just leave them until the following spring I leave them in some cases for for multiple years until they literally fall in falling down and I stake big tall verbascum stems and then they've been there for two or three years some of them because I think you know why do we some things why do we actually have to cut them down I, I think you know that's such a beautiful thing and uh and when you see a wall card be a male wall card be kind of nestled up inside a little um gold uh digitalis ferruginia like a uh, spent seed head like tucked in there you realize wow i mean this, these are the signs that we shouldn't be so you know formulaic and so uh, rigid about our processes we should be letting these flow and actually just observing so yeah I think a lot of the things that I started to do and to observe and to see uh, they were kind of I was ripping up the horticultural rule book you know leaving plant stems keeping the plant material close by you know um, not not repairing patches on lawns which is one of my big 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 things so whereas the the volunteers sometimes in Eden they're really keen to make you know the lawn look really good and I, and I definitely understand that but when I've observed, you know, tawny mining bees nesting in these bear patches, I'm, I'm obviously very passionate about that. And then as soon as I explain that to the volunteers, they're, they're more than on board with it. So these observations and these kind of instincts have helped me to kind of throw up some of the horticultural rule book. Um, the key one, I suppose, is products off the shelf. And I think there's quite a few people in the, in the industry at the minute trying to, uh, you know, convince the, the wider public that we don't need to buy something for every perceived problem whether it's a, a supposed pest or a disease or a, a growth issue or whatever actually most of these products are there for a commercial reason and, and and you can garden very well without spending a lot of money at all you don't need to really invest in these products and uh, yeah I think I found through instinct and through observing nature that you know you can you can steer gardens very nicely without some of the, the classic horticultural rule book as we as we like to say. I think there's an element of confidence involved in steering, as you put it, and curating, because I think that sometimes people can feel constrained by their knowledge of gardening and how it's been done. I think there's a fear element because they don't want to lose that control over their space and they feel like maybe if they let it go for, I don't know, two years or three years, then there'll be some sort of irreparable damage done or there'll be this loss of control over the look of the garden. So I think there's an element of confidence and I think there's an element of knowledge and some people might not have that confidence and knowledge to do that but how do you encourage particularly people like volunteers 
to just let go of the reins a little bit and to maybe sit back and observe? Do you just kind of pass on your knowledge in terms of wildlife and say, look, let's wait and see what happens. Let's observe. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually. And uh, a few things on that, I suppose. The one is that the best strategies that I've found for nature, and not just me, but other people have, will, will say this, is that it's a mixed approach. So the, the whole, when you perhaps get into garden and you want to start going into a wider direction, you think that leaving everything long or leaving things untouched might be the best approach. But what what I've found and what the kind of the consensus seems to be amongst some of the people in the industry who also kind of garden for wildlife is that the mixed strategy is best, you know. So that's a nice thing to tell people. You know, you can have, well, you should have some short long and you should have some long, permanent long and you should have some well-clipped shrubs and trees and you should have some you know completely untouched stuff so it's about that mixed strategy and that's that's quite liberating and um and john little's brilliant like that because he's always talking about there's no there's no mistakes really you know but that's quite a freeing thing to tell volunteers or to tell people who are kind of entering the industry there's no mistakes as long as you're not using one strategy for the whole you know the whole site you're like you know you use a mixed strategy you don't put all your eggs in one basket i think that's a really nice way to do it and if you don't fully understand it then stand back and, and don't make a, a massively bold decision you can just do a, a halfway house so whether it's pruning or leaving the stems and, and that's kind of the way i garden anyway it's a very mi mixed strategy you might have the uh the impression that i leave all all the plant stems tall but i, I certainly don't so i kind of will mix it up so it's always a a mixed strategy and you and to kind of the way I was taught to offset the real wildness, you definitely need some formal bits, and they're and they're really good for wildlife too. Having some clipped hedges and having you know a, ni a nice neat edge on on a lawn as well as a really long edge and and the other part of the garden. So it's all about this mixture, and that that's quite liberating, and that takes the pressure off people getting it absolutely right. And then, and yeah, as I say, the John Little kind of you know the, the the John Little line is that there's no real mistakes. You know you can't really make a mistake, and if and if you feel like it's a mistake, then it, it's not really an issue. We can we can just experiment with that for now. You know, so that's quite liberating. And mixed strategies, I think, is always a really liberating and and freeing approach too. Yeah. So the Eden Nature Garden, obviously, you you work there. There's other people that work alongside you. Is it a community garden? Who uses garden? So yeah, so basically it's a public space in Clapham. It's a uh, church land, but the uh, the nature garden side of it runs a, a religiously. So we welcome all faiths, and uh, it's open to the public, sunrise to sunset. I work there one day a week. I get paid a day a week, and then the rest of the help I get is local volunteers. Yeah, that's the kind of setup there. So I'm assuming the local volunteers who are also the people who will be using the public garden. And I think what you've been doing there is maybe a little bit different to what people are used to seeing in a public garden. And have you had kind of any pushback from the community or buy-in? Are they really kind of interested in what you're doing there? Yeah, so that's interesting. So when I started, the, the garden was known as Eden Community Garden. And, and obviously it is a community space and that's absolutely central and more important than anything else. But it felt to me like because vegetable growing was so difficult without running water and the garden being such a dry one that we needed a bit of an identity change. So four or five years into my my tenure so far, then we decided to call it Eden Nature Garden, which was a bit more in line with my approach for kind of encouraging wildlife and the kind of the wildlife encouraging approach, a bit more of an ecological take. And so that was a quite a big moment. And then we realized that, well, I realized more than anybody that I needed to embrace this middle of summer desert phase whereby the garden keels over if it's a dry summer like last year and, the, and everything turns to straw almost and the garden looks like it's been glyphosated but but we don't even use any chemicals so it, it's just kind of a quite a transition from a really colorful colorful spring into a, a midsummer desert phase and it can be quite shocking for visitors uh, who don't know the garden very well or people coming for the first time and so we've now incorporated signage into the garden to explain that you know this is kind of part of the natural cycle of what we see for plants and it's quite it's quite incredible really because there's not too many spaces i know that are, are regarded as a garden that have that that free and kind of let the plants do what they do in the middle of summer rather than as stephen used to say putting them on life support machines and trying to keep them constantly watered so the lack of irrigation has been embraced and i, I find that a really incredible case study for uh, you know a well a semi-world space in london to not irrigate and and when you know obviously when the rains come we have that germination triggered the new growth comes and 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 you kind of you realize that that is a very well 
a very natural cycle for plants. Do you have enough to keep people's interest during those times? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think it can be a little bit off-putting for some people. The signage we've got in the garden now is quite explanatory about this kind of phase and some of the plants that we grow, which are kind of usually undesirables for many people, and some of the branch piles, some of the, the slightly, you know, unkempt little portions of gardens or the borders, little pockets of habitat. But it is, it is quite a challenge for people to to, to visually take that in, I think. Um, but the, if one of us is there to explain to them, to give them that, the explanation and that we don't have running water this is the kind of natural cycle of plants you just wait till the rains come and we'll have a whole wave of germination and new growth and uh, people are usually at that point you know very on board with the you know the, the sustainability and the natural cycling of the garden but it is a big shock <laughs> i bet it is i mean i think it's interesting as well because the garden is so low input and i think there's a tendency for people to feel like they need to chuck a lot of money and a lot of resources of all sorts into a garden to make it work but actually you're proving there then that that's possible to achieve without all that input yeah yeah i mean tiny budget i can't tell you how tiny the budget's been for the last kind of nine years i've been involved but it's made it really exciting and, and you know the guy who taught me steve and he kind of showed me that the, one of the most exciting bits of gardening is you know splitting plants moving things that have germinated taking cuttings and you know, get, oh, moving plants from garden to garden. So you're weeding out in one garden, and then you you've taken them to another. I've got some of the the most undesirable plants from John Little's in Eden now because I thought I'm lacking some midsummer weedy asteraceae. I'm going to bring them into Eden. So it's quite. I've got plants that even John didn't want. <laughs> but that's the joy of gardening, isn't it? Moving plants around for free on a shoestring, and that 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 makes it more accessible and it makes it more more fun, really. I always think as well about gardening for wildlife. I've got this crazy idea. I don't know if I've mentioned it before. I'm going to share it. But I was thinking about wildlife gardens and I thought, you know, everybody is so into wildlife gardens at the moment. The onus is on garden owners and garden users to create spaces for wildlife at the moment. And I think it's fantastic. And I've long been a proponent of it. But then I thought, well, if we all create these kind of wildlife oases in our gardens, does it give the people who kind of control the public spaces and, you know, the wider countryside carte blanche really to say, well, you guys are looking after the wildlife. Therefore, we can actually continue to trash the countryside. There's a bit of me that goes, oh, do you know, I, I'm not sure. And the other part of me, the kind of flip side to that is is I'm kind of moving more and more as I grow as a gardener to thinking, well, is the onus on us to manage for wildlife or is actually the onus on us to produce food? And it's really interesting that you said that space just wasn't good for growing food. But is there a tension between wildlife gardening and food gardening? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, if you're really a keen plants person, you know, you can walk around the Eden Garden and there's plenty of edible you know foraging so to speak but on a kind of commercial scale or a, a, a semi-decent scale of growing say like an allotment um yeah i don't know i think there's a place for all of it really that's the same thing that boils back to that mixed strategy we need mixed strategies all over the place don't we so we need a mixed strategy within a garden we need a mixed strategy in terms of the spaces that we've got we need some allotments we need some maybe moderately formal bits and pieces we need some slightly wilder spaces we need some more intensively kind of managed spaces, but with a, a new thread or two of, you know, nature consideration or just sustainability in mind. So I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting take, to be fair. But I, I guess it's more all about mixed, you know, mixtures. So I think having a bit of this and a bit of that is, is good. So hopefully that this kind of new wave of wildlife gardening doesn't, you know, doesn't give carte blanche to others to perhaps, you know, continue in a similar similar vein that's not really working for anyone yeah i think like you said the mixed strategy leads to people to be site specific as you are so if you can spot a site and its potential as one thing or the other or a few different things and, and use it in that way rather than trying to shoehorn it into something that it's not then obviously i think yeah. that's probably the way forward yeah exactly and we can you can still have a bit of edible you know food growing in almost any space you know we've got apple trees we've got raspberries we've got blackberries you know some of the undesirable plants that i talk about to people the general public bringing in brambles and nettles and all that kind of stuff you know they're brilliant for wildlife but they're also good food plants aren't they your teas your soup your, your fruit i completely agree and actually thinking again about the wildlife and going back to what you said about you have a passion for bees and i wondered does that include honeybees Oh, yeah, it's an interesting topic. Well, I do love honeybees and I do love 
love a, a pot of honey as much as the next person but there's quite quite a lot of new research has come out in recent years and um some of it quite damning actually and uh one of the facts that is talked about at the minute is that the fact that there's never been more honeybees on earth than there are at present and that's quite a scary thing for a lot of people to digest when when the whole save the bee um you know slogan is branded out there but honeybees are, are technically livestock you know the farmed animals are, for the most part there are some examples of feral co colonies but in the uk we've got you know nearly 280 species of bee you know and only one of them is a honeybee and uh, like i say that one is largely farmed as livestock um, which is a lovely you know lovely product that we get from it but the, some of the research now that's come out in recent years is that honeybees are spreading disease to wild pollinators and they're out competing certain species for floral resources so there's it's quite a complicated situation at the minute and uh, the current advice from people at the London Beekeepers Association, which is on their website, which is a very good resource to refer to, which I can send you the link to, um, is not necessarily encouraging more hives. They kind of, they're very, the, the London Beekeeper Association are very on, on it in terms of the whole the broader ecological landscape and, and they're encouraging more habitat creation and more floral availability. So it, it is quite a complicated one at the minute, but the bottom line is that for most places at the minute, and for example, the UK, and I'm sure large, large swathes of America, honeybees are not necessarily the route to go down if we want to increase biodiversity or just to, to save pollinators they're a, they're, they're a single species that is, is quite dominant now and they're like i said they're technically a, a farmed animal and to use that kind of dave gorson quote, quote about if you want to save wild birds you don't start rearing more chickens it's that kind of analogy in terms of livestock so yeah it's, it's quite a, a, a topical debate at the minute yeah, and in terms of biodiversity in your gardens, and in particular, I suppose, because we've been talking about the, the Eden Nature Garden, you would be able to identify it, I think, because of your knowledge. But have you identified a big increase in biodiversity in the gardens? I think what I say about Eden is that I, I find it hard to quantify if the, there's been an increase, but I know that we really punch above our weight in terms of insect numbers for Zone 2 London. We really do. I mean, it's got if you were to kind of create a space within London, like a wildish space or an insect encouraging space, we, we really punch above our weight. We've got kind of veteran trees, which are brilliant for cavities and and just kind of habitat. We've got short lawns, we've got long lawns, we've got ponds, we've got a wide range of weeds and, and a more kind of cultivated ornamental plants that are, that are also offering, you know, wildlife benefit. So I don't know about the increase. I, I would like to think so. You know, but that just could be that I'm observing more and I'm more aware of species. It's hard to say, hard to be scientific about that. But we definitely punch above our weight in terms of in terms of, you know, wildlife visitors and in, in, insect visitors. And we've had some really interesting finds, actually. So, yeah, I think we've done very well. I, I'd love to think that we are increasing the numbers, but I couldn't be scientific about that. Fair enough. So thinking about your work going forward as well, have you got anything particularly exciting on the horizon that you're working on? Well, I suppose in, in Eden, there's lots of exciting habitat features that we're introducing. Um, at John and Fiona's in Essex, we're working on all kinds of exciting experiments and and some very interesting stuff there. Uh, helping out in a public space near the Welsh Harp or in the Welsh Harp in um, in London. We're introducing, a, trying to build a bee garden there with the wild pollinators. And so and just generally kind of working with lots of lovely clients around London in, in this space and trying to trying to push forward. So I, I suppose there's the whole ecology theme running through my work, is, which is quite nice. And people are more and more interested. And I'm, I'm just I'm just very happy to be doing what I'm doing. I, I guess I'm very lucky. Yeah, I think anyone who works in this industry is lucky, actually. And I suppose my final question to you is, it's a big question and I don't expect to a kind of comprehensive answer, but how do you feel the future of gardening is going to take shape in the UK? And are you excited about the way things are going? I think gardening has huge potential to do so much good. But I think there are, there are a lot of issues within gardening, the sustainability of it, the kind of the desire to create a carte blanche and, and have a full impact on a garden where you could just potentially steer an existing garden along and, and make some changes, but not wholesale. Um, we need to kind of get rid of the, the huge amount of plastic and, and transport costs. We need to think about all these things. There's, 
for such a brilliant industry and activity there's there are some huge challenges to 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 resolve but i think overall i'm definitely way more positive about the industry and how good it is for everybody and how much good it can bring so yeah definitely an overarching thumbs up and feel positive about it but i think this there's, there's, there's some key areas we need to all be questioning and challenging ourselves thank you benny for sharing your knowledge and thank you to you for listening I'll leave you now with Dr Ian Bedford and some very useful information about a particular problem you might be facing in the vegetable garden right now. It's probably a good idea to at least try and grow a few vegetables at home, particularly when we have a bit of time on our hands. Besides the pleasure of nurturing them through to maturity, there's also the assurance of knowing how they've been grown and, if necessary, what they've been treated with for pests and diseases. And probably the easiest group of vegetables to grow, whether in a pot, a garden bed, or an allotment, are the pod-bearing legumes, the peas and beans, and in particular, the broad bean. Their large seeds reliably germinate and can be sown in pots or directly into the ground from late autumn right through to late spring. Then with minimum effort, they'll grow and eventually produce pods that contain tasty, pale, kidney-shaped beans that can be harvested from early summer. As with most modern cultivars, though, broad beans will attract the occasional pest problem, so it's certainly worth being aware of these and understanding the impact they might have on the plants and whether or how they need to be dealt with. And with broad beans, there's really just two insect pests that could affect them, but thankfully, Neither requires much effort, if any, in keeping them under control and protecting the crop. The most common will be the black bean aphids, usually referred to as black fly, and often seen with black ants that farm them for their sugary honeydew. With small infestations, the plants will be fine if left untreated, and the aphids will usually end up as a valuable food source for other garden wildlife. But where larger infestations have developed, the plants can become weak and produce fewer pods, so they will require attention. And the simplest and safest way to do this is to just use water from a sprayer or a garden hose. Using the flat fan setting, the fine spray of water will knock the aphids off without damaging the plants. And by repeating this every few days, the aphids should soon be under control. The other common pest of broad bean is the bean weevil, a small dark brown beetle that emerges from the ground during spring to feed on the bean's leaves, causing distinctive notch-shaped damage around the edges. Its eggs are then laid into the soil and the resulting larvae feed on the bean's nitrogen storing nodules that form on its roots. Despite the visual leaf damage from the adults and the underground feeding of their larvae, the effects on a healthy, well-established plant will actually be negligible. So realistically, the bean weevil can be regarded as just a bit of a nuisance rather than a true pest, and could, perhaps, just be ignored. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.